Hello again, welcome to another episode of the Iranian Market Minute. Today is Monday, April 25th, and this is episode number 109. My name is Justin Hewn. I am your host. I'm the founder and publisher of the Uranium Insider Pro Newsletter, the only investing newsletter that focuses solely on uranium and publishes on a regular monthly basis. As always, nothing in this video is intended to be investing advice. I'm not your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Please always do your own due diligence when it comes to investing and always take responsibility for your own choices. All right, it's good to be back. Um, as I mentioned last week, I was out of the office for the last three days of last week. Um, I do appreciate everybody being here and watching this. And of course, we had an exciting few days in the uranium markets and all markets, really, especially the commodities, which all of them got hit extremely hard. And as we all know, uranium is, uh, if not the most volatile, one of the most volatile asset classes you can possibly invest in, which is why it attracts a unique audience of those of us who love volatility. Perhaps cryptocurrency might be one exception, um, possibly more volatile than uranium, although of the past six to 12 months, it seems like uranium takes the cake in terms of volatility. And the last few days have been no exception to that. I'm going to talk about that in the mailbag section. But of course, before we do that, let's go ahead and jump into the daily scoreboard where I will discuss the spot price movements. I will discuss the flows or lack thereof. And then we'll look at the charts. And if you do appreciate these videos, please uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell. You will be reminded whenever we publish a new episode which is almost every day. I will be here throughout this week um, and with no travel plans in the foreseeable future, should be almost daily here with this podcast getting back on after a few days off last week. All right, so jumping right into it, daily scoreboard. The spot price of uranium has slid precipitously over the past few days. It's dropped about $8 a pound since our last uranium market minute, which was last Tuesday. The numbers I'm going to give you here in terms of the flows are for three full days. So uh, we're now sitting at 54 pound mid market. All right, so what's the deal? So SPUT is out of the market right now because of the downturn in the market um, and SPUT generally trading at a discount to their net asset value over the past three weeks or so. They have raised very little cash. Uh, they've dipped into the market a couple of times over that time period to raise a small amount of money but they've largely been out of the market and they've dwindled their cash reserves down. They did purchase another 500,000 pounds of uranium since last Tuesday, but they did not raise any more cash. So now they're sitting on uh, just under $30 million in cash and they're not going to be buying any more uranium with that cash. So what does that mean? That means we need funds to float back into SPUT in order for them to raise more money by issuing shares on their at the market financing vehicle, their ATM, um, in order to raise cash to buy physical uranium. So with them out of the market and us nearing the end of the month, we have traders taking advantage of their absence and pushing that price down. They're uh, selling, uh, lowering their offer. The ask dropped all the way down to $55 a pound. The bid continued to drop, but they had no takers at 52. So it jumped back up to 53. Um, so it looks like we're going to be stuck at that level, at least for the time being. Either way, why does this happen? I mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating probably at least one, once a month when we see these types of shenanigans happen in the spot market and you know what's going on. When you know what's going on, you can uh, weather these storms a little bit more easily. So traders, uh, there are a number of traders. There's one in particular, a Japanese trading house called Itachu. Um, they often have a, in, an influence, a downward influence on the month and closing price of the spot market. Why? They have an offtake agreement. They get pounds from Uzbekistan and that forward month price that they pay for that uranium from that offtake is dictated by the month and closing price of, of spot uranium. Therefore, if there is a buyer, the largest buyer in the spot market right now, obviously is the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. If they are hamstrung with the sector downturn, sort of putting a pause on funds flowing into that vehicle, um, they can take advantage of that and they can sell some pounds in the market, dropping that ask, um, taking $8 off a pound off of their forward month offtake. Very intelligent. They do this as often as they can. Now, when the market is very thin, if there's buying pressure in the spot market, they don't do that. We didn't see much price manipulation the past few months. However, this was a uh, fortuitous turn of events for uh, uranium traders. And uh, that's why we're seeing that spot price drop. So whenever you see that anywhere near the end of the month, especially if you notice that spot is out of the market due to the price action in the, in the markets, generally speaking, and you know what's happening. It's trader manipulation, not really a big deal. Um, so like I mentioned over the last uh, three days, spot did buy 500,000 pounds. But there's nine consecutive days where they did not issue any new shares in that ATM. 
uh, physical uranium trust. They now hold 55.4 million pounds in the trust. Their total NAV has declined by over 400 million over the last number of days due to the decline in the uranium spot price primarily. Um, their NAV sits now at 3.07 billion. Year to date, SPUD has purchased 14.1 million pounds. They've raised almost 750 million in capital. They did close on Friday at a wide discount to NAV of minus 6.18%. Uh, the trust did recover intraday today, but the spot price didn't really move on the day. So they're likely still right around that same discount to NAV. We've yet to see a um, serious amount of funds come into this vehicle to arbitrage that discount to NAV, although the trading volumes are reasonable. Um, like I said, they're sitting on just under 30 million, 28.3 million in cash. ETFs. All right. So um, interestingly, on the big down day last week, which was Thursday, where we saw uh, both URNM and URA down over 10% on the day, that's a huge down day for an ETF, for any ETF. Um, I was chatting with uh, Tim Rotolo from URNM, from North Shore, excuse me. And he said that there were no outflows for URNM and they have yet to report any outflows from these moves. URA did uh, report an inflow, uh, excuse me, a, a new issuance of 350,000 shares. That's about 5.7 million in mandated buying, but we do know that these numbers are lagged. So I wouldn't be surprised to see in reporting by at least URA, possibly URNM of some shares being redeemed in the past couple of trading days. We will know that tomorrow and the next day. Um, the joint AUM between these two vehicles pulled back sharply, now sits exactly 3 billion. It's a decline of about 275 million due to the swoon in the sector from Thursday through today. All right, so why don't we go ahead and take a look at the charts. Like I said, Thursday was bloody. Uh, Friday was bloody, but about half as bloody. Today it opened lower, uh, traded down in the first couple of hours, but it did recover with a number of stocks across the space, actually closing in the green today which is a really good sign. And the broad markets did dip and recover on the day as well. Like I mentioned, URA had a huge down day on Thursday, another big down day on Friday, although we did see the dips being bought on Friday, despite the fact that the, that the S&P, um, the broad indices closed at their lows, just about just a couple of pennies off of their lows of the day on Friday. We did see a bit of dip buying come in on Friday across the uranium space, but that did not portend a strong open today. They opened down, they traded even lower, although most of the stocks across the space printed some kind of hammer. Is that a short term reversal? We will know in the next few days. It's possible. Pretty good trading volume here coming in. And as you can see, we did hold that lower trend line of this accumulation cylinder. Um, I mentioned this to members over the weekend that I was looking for a bit of further downside, that I wanted to see that 200-day uh, 200, 200 moving average hold. They lost the 200-day barely here. The next point down of obvious support would be this trend line. I would like to see URA make a higher low. Higher lows are pretty important in a bull market. Um, and of course, if we lost that higher low and it traded below this previous low of January, that would be a very, very bearish signal for the sector. I don't think we get there. Do we see further weakness? I don't know. Let's see. This looks like a nice reversal today, intraday. And of course, what happens in this sector is that people get short. Um, uh, some players get short when the sector starts moving down, retail panics and sells. Of course, you're going to have a number of people selling the low today if we do end up reversing on this move. Um, but what happens is the sector moves so incredibly volatile that when, uh, when we have these steep declines that don't really make a lot of fundamental sense, right? So what we had in this sector, I mean, despite the fact that the spot price got hammered due to the reasons I just mentioned, we saw commodities across the space get hammered. Um, let's look at BHP, for example, last week. Huge, huge declines on Thursday and Friday, gap down again today. Dip buyers finally did show up on big volume, but BHP, um, Rio had some, a number of very large cap commodity companies, mining companies reported uh, earnings with reduced production. So there, that, was, that was what the market generally reacted to. We also have a market reaction to what's going on in China. There is extremely harsh, extremely strict lockdowns happening in Shanghai, um, happening in, uh, uh, in, in a number of other very large cities in China. And so obviously the market interprets that as reduced demand. Uh, China obviously plays the biggest role in terms of commodity demand. Does that matter for uranium? Absolutely not. In fact, what did we see in the past week? We saw reports that China's plans for their uh, nuclear reactor build out 
are sticking. They plan to build another six, I believe it was the Hualong II reactors. Um, these are large reactors over a thousand megawatts and uh, China is continuing with that plan. So the fact that China is going through this, uh, these COVID lockdowns again, and they are extremely harsh, there clearly are supply chain problems, there's shipping problems, um, demand for certain commodities is likely to be reduced due to cities of, of 10 to you know 20 plus million people being locked down. But does that affect uranium demand? 100% not. So what we had here was the baby getting thrown out with the bathwater, broad markets turning down, commodities across the space getting hit. We saw uh, Netflix, which is one of the FANG stocks, a massive market cap stock with a lot of big institutional players. Um, get knocked by over 20% after poor er earnings. And those type of events have trickle down effects. Some of these large funds, if they own a tiny bit of commodities, a tiny bit of, let's say, uh, a position in URA or Cameco or Kazadamprom or NextGen, um, they might have to uh, rush to liquidity. And when you have a rush to liquidity, you sell what you own. And of course, the selling begets selling. Retail jumps on board, and here you have it. All of that said, if we actually zoom out a bit, things are not really looking all that bad. In fact, if you compare uh, the chart to the sentiment that's being spewed across Twitter, the vitriol, um, the resentment, the, the, the just the negativity that you're seeing across Twitter and across the investing space, does this chart look like it deserves that? No, it doesn't. With that said, um, uranium equities have underperformed the spot price of uranium. Um, but perhaps this is a little bit of a reset and maybe one that the sector needed. So I, I'd like to see some follow through on these hammer candles across the space. Um, Cameco printed a, a decent hammer as well, down 2.7% on the day, um, recovering a bit, sitting above the 50 day moving average. This is something that's, um, this, this chart is holding up very well here. We did see again that uh, Larry McDonald from the Bear Traps report, who's institutional newsletter went out in December 2020 and sort of kick-started this bull run, in my opinion. Um, he uh, increased his positioning in Cameco today uh, out to his newsletter, so that probably had some influence here either way. Um, he also updated over the weekend that uranium between URNM and Cameco, which are the two holdings that he recommends to his institutional, institutionally held newsletter, um, that this is a long, that he's moving it from a, from a short-term conviction basket to a long-term conviction basket. And that's really the point here, right? That's really what I want to hammer home here, not only with the, with the chart review, but also in the mailbag section is you have to keep your eye on the long-term prize. Kevin Bambro had an excellent tweet thread over the weekend that I highly suggest you check that out um, on Twitter. And just look at what he's saying is basically like there's absolute volatility in the space. There are opportunities to swing trade if that's your thing, but make sure you don't get shaken out in these, in these pullbacks. These pullbacks can be gut wrenching. Now this pullback is really not all that bad, but really what it did was it happened so quickly that it, it was, you know, a frightening thing to experience if you're long this sector. So um, really that pullback compared to, you know, what we experienced from November to January, which I'm going to touch on the mailbag section, was really not all that bad. It just happened very quickly. So we'd like to see some support here, but obviously keep your eye on the long-term prize. We have still yet to see um, a really strong rotation into commodities from the, from the tech stocks, from the, you know, from the growth stocks into value. Those are, we're still in the early, early innings of that, assuming that does play out in the way that we expect it to. So hang on, uh, really zoom out weekly charts. If you're long and you want to remain long due to your fundamental uh, thesis, due to your long thesis and your conviction on the fundamentals for the sector, you might as well not even watch the screens in the short term. I mean, that's really uh, the, the best advice I could give there is just to zoom out, um, pay less attention to the intraday noise, the intraday movements. And when you see the sector selling off without justification for it, now, when I say ultimately the justification for the sell-off doesn't really change the fact that you're seeing, you know, a reduction in the value of your own portfolio, right? It's, it's being sold off whether or not you think it should. Um, and of course, we never expect things to go up in a straight line, but uh, a commodity sell-off due to China locking down has absolutely nothing to do with uranium, nothing at all. Um, uh, the commodities, uranium sector selling off due to poor earnings, uh, uh, earnings calls and projected uh, production numbers coming from Vale, coming from Rio, coming from BHP. What does that have to do with the uranium space? Absolutely nothing. In the case of BHP, well, they do produce some uranium, so it could result in slightly less production in uranium. That's purely speculation on my part. But if that's the case, that's actually bullish for the space. 
So uh, just make sure that you zoom out and don't focus too much on these on these pullbacks. I know that they can be gut wrenching, but uh, just zoom out and look at these charts. They they look brilliant. Okay, let's look at the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. Lastly, before we move on to the mailbag section, again traded at a severe discount to NAV. We were probably pushing a ten percent discount to NAV today. That's the largest discount to NAV that we've seen um, over the past couple of months. So in my opinion, we are likely to see <clears throat> some traders come in and arbitrage that discount. I think that's what happened intraday today, as we saw it trade back up and actually closed barely down on the day, down uh, 12 cents, excuse me, two cents on the day. <clears throat> so uh, nice to see that recovery intraday for this prop physical uranium trust, as well as across most stocks in the space. We see that MACD is now at a level that it was on a pretty sharp pullback back in October. We'll see if that marks a reversal uh, in terms of RSI. And in MACD, we could see a little bit more downside here, but in my opinion, we're nearing a low in terms of the movement of this particular vehicle and the spot price, considering we are close to the end of the month. And it seems like it's stuck today with the bids being dropped and the ask didn't budge. So why don't we go ahead and jump into the mailbag section here. Um, and this, I'm just gonna basically talk about um, risk on, risk off, uh, the commodity space, and just the volatility of uranium in general, okay? So there's a market expression, which is risk on and risk off. Risk on is basically um, a time when investor confidence in the markets is high, and investors are willing to put on risk by putting their own money to work, the money that they manage to work in a market they expect to go higher, and risk off is, is the exact opposite. Risk off is when there's fear, when there's uh, uh, confidence in the markets is reduced, and investors pull back, uh, they sell whatever they hold, they sell a, any sectors that they feel are going to underperform. And generally speaking, we have been in a overall risk off environment for the, for the better part of 2022 so far, that it largely has to do with an S&P 500 uh, chopping sideways, NASDAQ is down substantially on the year. Um, most of the broad indices are flat to down, and uh, they continue to chop and look generally weak. Now that has that has a lot to do with a, with a lot of different elements, and I'm not going to pontificate too deeply on that, other than the fact that um, you know the Fed continues to um, not only raise rates but talk about raising rates further. Um, ra rising interest rates obviously reduces demand um, and, and slows down the economy, and the market doesn't like that. So that's one reason. Um, another reason you could argue that you know things are are relatively volatile and unstable in the world right now. We have an actual kinetic war happening in the Ukraine. Um, we have we we have a spineless, seemingly useless leaders in the bulk of the countries in the West. Um, that doesn't exactly give uh, people confidence in the economies, give people confidence in the markets. Um, these things affect the markets, and we've seen that choppy broad market. Now, of course, everything that's happened this year so far um, with supply chain disruptions, with high inflation, you know, inflation is another element that adds uh, you know, a lack of confidence to the markets. But inflation does positively affect the price of everything, essentially, and especially real goods, uh, real things, real tangible things. I think that we're in a bull market of things, and I think that's going to last a very long time, and uranium should benefit from that. With all of that said, uh, being in this risk-off environment currently, um, why are uranium stocks getting hit so hard? All right. So first, we're going to acknowledge that the broad market has been in risk off, right, for the most part of this year so far. We've had huge drops in some high-flying NASDAQ names, Netflix, PayPal, Facebook, Roku, many others with year-to-date drops that are pushing 30, 40, even up to 50%. Huge, huge declines in these very, very large growth stocks. Now, that has an effect, and like I said, it has a trickle-out effect into all markets when you have moves like that. Um, uranium sector was able to resist the risk off environment uh, largely this year because of the steadily rising price of uranium. Of course, that was up until last week when we saw that sharp drop. Um, and again, that's my reasoning for that. We already covered uh, trader manipulation towards the end of the month with sput out of the market. It's not something that is a permanent issue. This is just traders doing what traders do. Um, so why are they selling off so hard? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm surprised at how quick this happened. Um, and it's not that I didn't expect any sort of pullback within that Livermore accumulation cylinder, where generally speaking, you zoom out, uh, you pull back a bit and see, generally speaking, we're going from the lower left to the upper right in these charts. Um, and there's pullbacks along the way. So pullbacks don't really surprise me. The speed and the severity of this one was surprising. Um, and so what did we see here? Uh, you know, the, 
with the broad market on the defensive here, uh, with the fear of these interest rate increases, et cetera, et cetera. So, but you have to ask yourself, given what we know about the power crisis, energy crisis that we're seeing across the world, um, especially in countries such as Germany, especially countries in the EU that are beholden to Russian oil and gas, um, we're seeing major energy crises and we're seeing the same thing in other countries. We're seeing the same thing in Japan, in certain areas of the States. We're seeing it a bit, if not we're you know, just much, much higher prices for energy. But generally speaking, we are in a time of a crisis for energy. Given what we know about that, given what we know about climate pledges, countries like France, Britain, South Korea, Japan, all doubling down on their nuclear build out plans. Uh, given what we know about potential sanctions uh, these are liable to be imposed on Russian source uranium, either through edicts, legislation, or self-sanctioning by Western utilities that will refrain from doing business with Russia because of uh, what's going on in Ukraine. Um, are interest rates 1% higher, 1.5%, 2% higher, are they going to derail this bull market for uranium? No, I don't think so. They obviously have their influence on the broad markets. And in crash situations, um, everything gets taken down. When people rush to liquidity, they sell what they own. And sometimes uranium gets lumped into that. But of course, we are focusing on long-term. We are zooming out. We are in this for a strong run. What we believe is going to be a continued strong run for uranium. So is this volatility and quickness of this drawdown nausea-inducing? Absolutely, without a doubt. We've seen this movie before, have we not? What's the most recent example? November 2021. On the 9th of November, the URA ETF reached a price of $31.60 a share. That was the high. Um, that was the high of this entire cycle so far. On January 24th, URA of this year, URA traded to a low of $18.71 a share. That's a drop of 40.7% in 10 weeks. That was a persistent long term pullback. That one hurt. Um, obviously, if you're watching this channel, we covered that over and over and over. That's how recent we saw a 40% decline. So what did we just experience last week? Um, or really over the past week and a half, let's say. Uh, 10 days ago, April 13th, URA traded up to 28.49. Today it traded to a low of 22.93. That's a drop of 19.5%, okay? In seven trading days. That's pretty fast. But compared to what we've experienced, this is nothing. This is nothing. We're going to have pullbacks like this over and over and over and over and over. So considering that volatility, I want to give you some insight into our process and what we give, what we, what we say in our every single monthly newsletter to uh, members of Uranium Insider Pro um, on how they can better stomach this uh, incredibly uh, volatile market and how they can hang in there, okay? First, number one, make a rational portfolio allocation to this sector. So that obviously is subjective. That's up to you what that means. What is rational? What is a rational uh, uh, exposure to this sector? So for me, what that means is not all of my investable wealth is in uranium, and I know this sector like the back of my hand. Um, it's, it's unwise to trade with leverage, and I'll mention that in, a previous, in, in one of the next bullets, but um, it's unwise to put all of your eggs in one basket. So a rational allocation does not mean I'm so excited about these fundamentals being fantastic, which I am, that I'm going to put my every last penny into this sector and expect it to be up tomorrow and day over day. That's not rational. And that's not what we would ever suggest to do. So number one, make a rational portfolio allocation. Why? This sector hits above its weight. You don't need leverage. You don't need all of your money in one company or two companies or even one sector. This sector hits above this weight. You have a, a smaller allocation to this sector and you just hang in there for a number of years, you're going to be very pleased with how that performs most likely, okay? So uh, let's see, number, excuse me, I lost my notes. There we go. Do not invest your total allocation at once. This is something that we've mentioned over and over. Um, we always recommend entering into tranches, into positions in, uh, in tranches. Why? Because the market gives us days and weeks like this um, unexpectedly. So as bullish as you are, when you enter into a position, usually do that over multiple tranches. Uh, do not use leverage or margin. The uranium names already possess, possess tremendous upside leverage to an improving uranium price. If you do not use leverage, you will avoid being a day late and a dollar short. Should a market swoon, uh, create an unfortunate situation where you're sold out of your positions by avoiding the use of leverage. You will also ensure that you will be capable of remaining invested 
over a two to four year investment horizon time period in which we believe this sector and more specifically, our focus list selections will show very robust returns. No leverage. If you get bowled up because of fundamentals, because of watching this podcast, because of somebody, some, something somebody said on Twitter, and you YOLO into some Cameco um, out of the money front month calls, that's on you. All right. You want to use leverage. You want to use margin. Go ahead. But it's not something we ever do or recommend. Do not become overinvested in one name. Pay attention to the weightings. Um, so we, in, in our focus list, we have um, particular weightings for our holdings and they are there for a reason. Know yourself, invest amounts that are within your comfort zone. I've said this over and over and over. If you were extremely stressed on Thursday and Friday, you probably have too much invested in the sector. Um, if you are obsessed over the, the daily, hourly, five minute charts of a certain name, you probably are over invested in that name. If you are emailing me once a week about a name, you probably own too much of that name. Uh, if, so if, if you're stressed out about it, you own too much. You, you need to reduce your exposure to this sector because you won't be able to hang on if you're literally pulling your hair out and sweating watching um, volatile days like Thursday and Friday because we're going to have these again. I am very confident in a long-term market for uranium and most commodities, but it is going to be volatile. We are in a different era here. We're not in, um, you know, we're not in the 2000 teens where, for the most part, the broad markets just kind of went up and up and up. Um, you know, this is we're in a, a, a situation where we have rising rates, we have rising inflation, we have political instability, we have actual kinetic war. Um, this is going to be a choppy market. It's going to be difficult to hang on. It's going to be difficult to trade. So you're going to have to hang in there, and you're going to have to allocate in a way that makes sense for you and to. Uh, and with an amount that makes sense for you so that you can hang on. Um, being over-invested that creates stress, what that stress does is it, is it causes an investor to act irrationally, to buy irrationally, to sell irrationally. And it's very easy. It's very easy to get shaken out. And if you did get shaken out in the last couple of days, that's okay. Um, you know, it, it happens and it happens to the best of us, but um, we are long, we are just hanging on through this volatility. We're very confident in this market in the mid to long term. In the short term, volatility reigns. So uh, I hope that those bullet points and those aspects of what we do and what we recommend in terms of um, tips to hang in there in this market has helped you a little bit. If it has, I would appreciate if you liked the video and shared it. Hopefully we can share this around and um, help some people out. And especially there's a lot of new investors that are watching this channel that are uh, coming into the uranium space um, I think that we're seeing still early stages of uh, the attractiveness of resource stocks, uh, of uh, value stocks in general, especially with the growth stocks turning over. And I think that that's only just begun. So to the extent that we can help out new investors, that's something that we really um, feel proud of doing on this channel. And hopefully you can do the same. All right. I think that's enough for today. Sorry for the rambling. If you made it this far, congratulations. Uh, hopefully we'll see some follow through on today's dip buying. I was very encouraged to see that movement intraday. And um, let's see if we can close in the green on the week. That'd be a very good sign. All right. Take care. We will see you again tomorrow. Cheers.